Welcome everyone to ConnectedLearning.tv. This is the 43rd the 43rd webinar in our series. Uh, I'm Mimi Ito and I'll be taking two roles today uh, as the moderator and also uh, as a co-presenter with Katie Salen. Uh, and we're here today to talk among other things about um, putting connected learning in practice but also uh, a report that we just released today out of our research network on connected learning. So we're super excited about that. Um, it's a really special day for us. So we really appreciate you joining us um, in uh, celebrating the release and also having a conversation about the report. Uh, for those of you watching on live stream, we encourage you to use the chat stream to introduce yourselves, connect with each other, share resources, and also really important to post questions for us that uh, we will try to uh, do our best to answer um, or address at least in the uh, hangout here today. Uh, there's also a URL for shared note taking that should be included in the live stream chat. Uh, so it, that's just a place to, you know, share, uh, help uh, capture highlights and share resources related to today's topic. Uh, so um, uh, Katie and I are joined by uh, um, one participant in our hangout for now, but we're hoping uh, we'll have some other participants joining us. Uh, we've been having a little bit of a technical issue with G+, which is why Howard Rheingold uh, wasn't able to get in to moderate uh, this morning. But I did want to uh, invite uh, Leanne to introduce herself before uh, Katie and I get into some of the discussion. Oh, hi. Um, and this is interesting. I didn't know I was the only one in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully we'll have more folks joining. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Leanne Wagner. Um, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. I am an independent designer and consultant and do research for the National Science Foundation on their creativity and IT initiative. And Katie is actually on our advisory board for that. So this fits in really nicely to hear about this. Um, what we're doing is um, a research, researcher workshops with kids in gaming and learning about the design process and encouraging um, new creative new creative IT uses with the kids through game design. So, Fantastic. Great to have you here with us today. And it looks like we've been joined by Buffy. Uh, Buffy, could you introduce yourself and your uh, relationship to some of this work? Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, there you go. Okay, we're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you, Buffy. I don't know if it's just me. Maybe we'll give... Buffy, maybe we'll give you a, a sec to sort out your sound. Hopefully, uh, John can support you in the back channel while you do that. Um, and we'll have you introduce maybe after we get into the discussion a bit. Um, so I think uh, we're trying a format with the Hangouts that is a little bit uh, less structured than some of the Hangouts, uh, the webinars we've been doing so far. Uh, we want this to be really an open discussion uh, about uh, issues around our report and around putting connected learning in practice. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Katie Salen, who is one of the co-authors of the report, a member of the Connected Learning Research Network, also executive director of a nonprofit called the Institute of Play that's focused on games and learning, um, including uh, work uh, in uh, founding and supporting the Quest to Learn schools uh, in Chicago and New York. Uh, I think the link to the report that was just released from the Research Network is available on the live stream chat uh, if you haven't already seen that come across your social media networks. Uh, so I wanted to uh, maybe start off, Katie, with giving you the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, your work with the research network and uh, what you think is important about the, uh, the report we released today. Sure. Um, so my role on the network is um, 
Well, the first thing I'll say is that it's actually really exciting to have this report out in the world. Um, it was really written um, in a spirit of process. Um, Mimi's talked about it as a perpetual, in a state of perpetual beta. Um, so it's a document that was written by a very interdisciplinary team of folks, um, the research network. My background is in design proper, uh, and most of the work that I do is really uh, on the ground trying to figure out how to build things around the core principles that the researchers on the team are uh, developing kind of theories about and models about. Um, and one thing to me that's really interesting about the report is that it has a the first section that is really focused on the kind of theory behind the work and where it comes from and what the stance might be in terms of the kind of change that we hope to see in the world around the connected learning model. Um, and then it really moves into a, a body of work in the latter part of the document that tries to look at, well, what would it look like on the ground? And what might be some core principles, some guiding principles um, that could help people that are interested in doing this work with young people, um, that work in institutions, that work in schools, that work um, in informal or formal learning spaces, um, how might they be able to uh, begin to modify existing programs that they're already working on, build kinds of software that they're already interested in building, um, but design it in such a way that it really aligns with the, the principles that we have um, ideas about, um, but not definitive answers about. So um, the interdisciplinary nature of the, of the team, I think, is quite unusual um, in the sense that the, uh, everyone is bringing a really different perspective to the table. Um, and everyone is really, again, in this state of mind that we, we don't have the answers, but what we're really trying to do is synthesize um, sets of best practices kind of across across a set of fields, put forward some ideas about really what might be possible, um, and then really invite invitation from a lot of people to begin to evolve that model. Yeah, so as Katie is uh, talking, I think um, I agree that one of the things that I'm most proud of in the report is that it was very interdisciplinary and also uh, drawing in research and research perspectives from folks who look at a wide range of different settings. So popular culture, as well as formal education, as well as informal education and kids' peer culture. Uh, and that made it really, really challenging, to be quite honest. But I think, um, you know, I thought it was important is that we really worked through our differences and struggled to bring our perspectives together. Um, and I think the one that, as a social scientist, I'm most proud of is we have uh, an economist on our network, Julie Shore, it was kind of my first uh, time collaborating with an economist and, um, you know, we, I thought it was really, really critical that we have that broader uh, political economic context to thinking about changes in education because so much of our work in education and um, youth focused research like I'm involved in, it's not like totally micro and we understand the institutions, but we're often not thinking in terms of the broader economic changes. And she was really bringing in the perspective is that there's only so much you can address in terms of equity within education. So the idea that somehow if you educate kids, it's going to expand opportunity if you're in a context where the economic picture is really bleak there's only so much that education can do. And so contextualizing in terms of some of these broader realities around um, resources and equity and workplace um, uh, opportunity, I thought was really, really important and something as an educational researcher, as an ethnographer, I don't really have to grapple with as much as I probably should. Um, so it looks like we've been joined by a few more people on the Hangout, which is awesome. Um, so I'd like to give an opportunity to uh, have our uh, participants on the Hangout introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what brings them into this conversation. Uh, Anmay, do you want to jump in? Oh, you got to unmute. Here. Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. You sound great. I'm, I'm joining um, from the MacArthur Foundation and just really excited about the release today and um, want to hear what um, uh, people have to say about it and um, and and how it's going to impact their work moving forward. Thanks, Anmay. It's great to have you here and um, Anmay has really been along the journey of developing these principles in the report, so I'm sure shares our relief at finally getting something out. Uh, 
<laughs> Buffy, how are you doing with your microphone? Um, I think I have audio now. Are you able awesome. to hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm a former school librarian and now learning strategist for the Cleveland Public Library. So much of the work that I'll be doing here will be thinking about creating communities of learning and how do we create the learning experiences that are more participatory in nature and thinking about, you know, how do we make lifelong learning um, that truly connected experience and not just for people who are coming to the library, but how can we more effectively partner with our local schools, our institutions of higher ed and other community organizations that have similar goals for learning. Great. Thanks, Buffy. So, um, and thanks to both of you for jumping in at the last minute. I'm really glad this worked out. Uh, so I want to give the opportunity, um, Katie and I have raised a few things that uh, we wanted to flag, but I wanted to give the opportunity to our Hangout participants to raise any questions, uh, make any comments. Or we could also um, look at what's happening on the live stream and bring stuff in if nobody wants to jump in immediately. Uh, well, I'll, I will pose, um, uh, you know, a question for Katie, um, which is sort of building on some of what um, I think, Katie, you started the conversation off with, which is uh, this challenge of having this work in perpetual beta and trying to figure out ways of providing principles and guidelines to support the design and development of programs when we're still working the model out. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to, you know, sort of the the opportunities and challenges of working with the model and the environments that you've been designing for and how it's maybe similar or different from other kinds of design models or guidelines. Sure. So the, you know, the origin of the principles is that they, you know, they partially came from some of the work that, that the research network has been doing, but also from, again, a whole host of folks that have been working in the informal and informal learning spaces that have been integrating new media, beginning to look at uh, models of collaborative peer-based learning um, that are really advocating for really new ways of, of working with young people. Um, and so the, what we tried to do is take those theories and uh, boil them down into a core set of ideas, which, you know, in, in our own work at the, I'll just use the example of our schools, which have both a formal component, their sort of regular school day, but also a fair number of informal learning opportunities um, embedded both in the school day, but also after school and in, in the summer, um, and work with um, staff to try to make sense of those principles was really the first step. So the, the first question we always, always ask is, well, how do you see your current practice reflected within, within these principles? What are things that you're already doing um, that you feel like align with this? And then begin to look at sort of, well, where might there be gaps um, or um, opportunities to begin to build in uh, different ways of kind of thinking about, you know, thinking about those principles. So one of the big roles that we advocate for in the report um, and is reflected in the principles is this idea of, of having adults be translators for young people between a range of spaces and a range of types of learning experiences that they may be participating in. So they may be at home um, playing in an online Minecraft community. Um, they're doing some formal work in their writing class at school. They're part of a club. They're part of an after-school club. You know, what role might an adult play um, in helping a young person take that interest in Minecraft and, and find ways to activate that within the club space, within the, the writing class, within, within the after-school after space? And, you know, and working with the teachers and um, mentors in, in our schools and, the, again, both the formal and informal programs, that question of the translator is actually quite a challenge. Because um, it requires you as an adult to pay attention to a set of things that may not be part of your everyday practice. Um, so really paying attention to interests that kids have outside of school. Uh, maybe paying attention to a game environment that may feel really foreign to you. And, and really trying to understand um, what is it about those spaces that a child is really developing an interest, cultivating mastery around um, in ways that you can then say, well, in my practice as a writing teacher, 
these are types of connections that I might be able to make for that young person. So that's one area that we um, have found uh, to be quite a challenge um, with the teachers and mentors that we're working with. Again, not that it represents a totally new type of practice, but it does come with a different set of expectations. Um, and so always starting with the question of, well, what are you already doing that's in line with this? And then what are some changes in practice that you might be able to bring to the table um, to really uh, align yourself with, with the principles? And that's sort of how we've, um, in our own work, evolved those principles and constantly sort of checking in, again, around the sense making. So what does this look like on the ground? And then how might we go back and tweak that principle? And I think as a research network, we're really um, putting out an open invitation to hear from folks as they start to grapple with these principles. What does it look like on the ground in the current practice? What's making sense? Um, what are sort of new dimensions that could potentially be brought to those principles? And then also, what are examples of what it really looks like on the ground? Um, and we found that um, talking about the concrete examples, and the report has a series of these sort of narrative case studies that, that say, well, this is what it looks like in reality on the ground, that that's just incredibly useful. And I think that the research network um, as a whole and as the field as a whole grows, collecting more and more of those stories is going to be fundamental to building the field. Sort of in that spirit, Katie, I, I wanted to see it. Uh, Buffy, you've been a friend of Connected Learning for a while. and. I'm sort of curious if you have any uh, stories to share, maybe war stories to share about trying to implement some of this in the library context. Um, yeah, you know, it's been interesting in um, you know the school library environment that I worked in. Um, you know, we found that for many of our teens, you know, initially um, these kinds of learning experiences that we thought would be liberating and initially very empowering in some ways really um, were a little uncomfortable for students um, because they have been so schooled in the culture of standardized testing um, and this culture of school that valued, you know, very concrete, you know, correct answers that suddenly when, you know, we were trying to, you know, gauge what their interests were and how some of the things that we were exploring related to um, ideas and passions that they cared about is very interesting that they initially were at a loss. Um, I'll never forget one student commenting, well, nobody ever asked me what I thought. And that sounds so simple, but yet I think it was a very, you know, profound indictment on the kinds of um, learning experiences, um, sadly, that this student you know, had. So, you know, you, there was initially kind of honoring that discomfort and uneasiness. And then, um, you know, as Kate, not really trying to listen and learn what were the things they cared about and how could we help students make their own connections, not necessarily just us as the teachers and the librarians, you know, that adult figure uh, drawing, you know, those, those lines for them, but letting them figure out where were their areas of interest um, to things that we might be looking at in the context of the curriculum and what did that have to do with the real world and things that matter to them and, and once you know, we worked through that, that initial uneasiness um, it was really um, really inspiring to see how the, the teens began to flourish you know, in this kind of learning environment um, but I think you know we, we assume many times that you know, this is really easy and that, you know, they're just going to immediately take to it like ducks to water. But, you know, in fact, there will be some, um, you know, young learners that initially may find that a little threatening because for some, too, I think it disrupts a model of school success um, that some of them, you know, have mastered in being able to, you know, just regurgitate, if you will, you know, what the teacher has asked them to do instead of, you know, forming their own discourse about what they're learning. Yeah, that's a really interesting set of dynamics. And I think it's kind of inherent in the connected learning model that we're really pushing up against these sites of tension between the academic learning cultures and the peer learning cultures and the popular culture. And that those kinds of negotiations and tensions are actually really inherent to the model. Like if everybody was just in alignment all the time, it probably means we're not pushing for new linkages and translations. So those struggles seem really characteristic of 
the challenges, but also the dynamics that we really want to see happening, pushing people into new paradigms and beyond their comfort zone. Um, I don't know, Leanne, you, you've done a lot of work kind of also at interesting hybrid interfaces between play and learning and so on. I'm wondering if you've seen similar or maybe different kinds of dynamics in your working with young people. Sorry, I have to keep unmuting myself. Um, yeah, I mean, what Buffy was saying with the kids having trouble kind of breaking out of that, that, I don't know, regurgitation cycle, if you want to say that. I teach college kids as well as my research focuses more on um, maybe third through eighth graders. But even the college kids, I see that a lot with too. Um, even in the design spectrum, it's really hard to get them to kind of just deliver on the, what, what size do you want this? What color should it be? You know, it's it's really interesting that they're, even in that that environment where they're supposed to be, or you know, being encouraged to be really creative, that they they have a lot of trouble, um, kind of I don't know, forming a consensus of what they should be doing for the project. Um, as far as I'm trying to think, I, I mean, we've done some projects in the New York Public Library, um, in like the Chinatown Library, and we had a lot of trouble um, just getting connecting interest like keeping interest with these kids um we kind of thought they would be really excited to um be in this kind of a uh, program this after school thing um but we found out that it, i don't know it, i don't know if it was just the environment or how we formed it formed the workshop itself but it was really difficult to get them to be engaged and to continue on with that kind of creative process um, and what these kids are typically doing is they're taking board games they're modding board games and then after we mod board games we kind of move into a more creative cycle where they develop their own games and then we interject digital technologies which a lot of times is qr codes with younger kids and then we try to use some more um, like eris and some other um, applications and things like that with older kids um, yeah i i I would say that I, what she's saying, uh, what Buffy's saying is a lot of what we are seeing as well. It's a lot of difficulties with that. We have a lot of trouble getting kids to um, kind of bridge the gap between what they're familiar and comfortable with from 2D to 3D space as well is something that we've really had a lot of difficulty with. I don't know how relevant that is to kind of where we are right now, but that's been one of our bigger challenges with the things that we've been doing. You mean to get away from the screen-based media into the physical media, is that what you mean by the 2D, 3D transition? Yeah, I mean, specifically when we're dealing with the games, um, we're dealing with 2D um, board games, things like that, and then we move into more urban gaming platforms where oh, we're in more 3D environments. Like I said, I'm not sure quite how relevant this is um, to kind of the topic at hand, I guess. <laughs> but It's interesting, though. I mean, I think getting concrete pictures of some of the design work is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, for me, the connection is that people, there, there may be a perception that um, just because something is interest-based, that kids are automatically going to sort of connect into it. Um, and, and we actually know that's not the case, right? That there's actually a whole host of young people that don't really know exactly what their interests are, or they may have a sense of wanting to pursue certain types of interests because there's expectations from adults around that those are these interests are better than those interests. Um, and so it's important, I think, in the in the model that connected learning puts forward, that interest is sort of just one piece of the pie, um, and it's sort of one way into the model. But there are other ways in, from a kind of social peer based piece to even the adult um, institutional piece, that that might be a starting place for kids. So um, I think the point was really, you know, really relevant, Leanne, because it's uh, easy to think, oh, if we just make this about kids being interested, that yeah. and around their interests, that it's automatically going to be a great connected learning environment. And that's just not the case. Yeah, and some things that we've done to kind of combat some of those earlier workshops is um, we've started integrating more narrative because that's something that we've found, especially the younger kids are really adept at, and that helps bring them into, I guess what you're saying, Katie, is we kind of assumed that they'd be really excited about making games, um, especially because a lot of them were put into these workshops because they had an interest or their parents found they had an interest in games. and. Um, so we've kind of incorporated more narrative into it. And some of our more successful ones, um, we have a couple workshop leaders that are really, really good at connecting with kids. And um, you know Kyle, Katie from um, Parsons. Um, he's really, really good at connecting with kids in the sense that he got really into like um, Korean boy bands with the one kids that he was working with and had a really successful experience and just trying to kind of make those connections exactly what you're talking about to get them really interested in building games. Um, so, I mean, we've had some successes with, you know, 
some people are just better at connecting with the kids, I guess. That can make a big difference. Yeah, so I want to make a bridge a little bit from what Buffy was talking about um, to a kind of, the kind of parent space. And uh, one of the questions from the live stream um, was asking about how, how do you begin to orient parents to a connected learning model within school? So we talked a little bit about how you orient young people and some challenges around that. So Mimi, could you talk a little bit just about the parent piece and what some opportunities and challenges might be around, you know, kind of bringing parents al along with us on this journey? Well, it's been really interesting because my kids have entered their teenage years right as we were pulling all of this together. So I feel like I've been living the parent dilemmas around this. And I think as a parent, um, well, and I'll mark myself as sort of a privileged and highly educated parent, you know, one of the big dynamics is that there's this tremendous pressure uh, and what we call sort of an arms race and achievement to succeed along the traditional pathways, right, that we've kind of been taught is the pathway to success um, and this is something we talk about in the broader political and economic terms in the report uh, at the same time that you know a lot of parents myself included kind of are understanding that what it means to thrive in the 21st century requires this much more entrepreneurial sort of demand driven inquiry based problem solving orientation to learning and that in fact you know that whole banking model of education that if you learn facts and skills you know that's what's going to get you ahead we know that that's not really preparing our kids for the kinds of future opportunities and contrib contribution to society that we want them to be making as, a, as adults. So we're caught in this bind because the fear of failing along the traditional pathway is really real, right? More and more kids, those pathways are narrowing. So it's not just some irrational fear. It's like, oh, these my kids are not going to get into the same schools and jobs that I kind of got shooed into because the climate is really different now. So that's a real fear that parents have at the same time that there's a lot of um, unrest and dissatisfaction with the test-based sort of rote learning form of education. So it's a weird time where culturally there's a lot of critique of, uh, old, you know, old-fashioned or whatever traditional uh, forms of rote learning um, at the same time that we are feeling really committed to them because the accountability to them is really, really high. So I think parents and kids are in a really tough spot right now, and we kind of have to do both. Um, and so that that's the really tough thing from an everyday attention time management perspective. Now, I think as a parent um, myself, the way I try to promote connected learning um, in my family, there's relatively simple things, some of which you know, traditionally middle class and privileged parents do, which is you foster your young, uh, your children's interests, you find tutors and mentors and chess clubs and awesome things. But I think what's different is that um, the online world provides an avenue into a lot of those things, whether it's finding communities online, um, going to online forums to ask questions. Uh, these are the kinds of things that not all parents are actually comfortable with. Um, and allowing your children that space to explore and to engage with your kids in that exploration and support and not being afraid of what might happen on the internet because overall it's actually a lot more safer for them to be exploring online than you know in other places and we're sort of culturally shifted to feeling very afraid of letting kids have freedom in real space so let them have freedom somewhere you know that kind of exploration is so important it's like it's a little bit of freedom but it's something so I feel like the online world is this huge opportunity space that um, not all parents are quite comfortable with seeing as a learning opportunity and that was sort of the big thing that came out of our original research was that there was a big gap between young people thinking of the online world as a lifeline to exploration social connection knowledge and parents thinking that their role was to monitor screen time and keep them away from the online world and so starting to understand that it's like you know with power comes responsibility you have to equip your young people to make productive uses of technology and the power that the online world happens to give them and that requires developing and cultivating capacities for the things that Howard Rheingold has been describing as you know crap detection and uh, attention management and all of those things these are new skills and competencies that you have to help your kids develop 
Um, and that, I think, is really the role of the parent to be there as a guide um, in finding those uh, places for growth, really. Um, and then I'll just say one thing. I have a lot to say on the parenting thing because it's like every day for me. Um, but I mean, the other thing that's really fun is if you can get involved enough in your kids' interests without being too overbearing, but enough so that if those conversations you have about school can connect to stuff that they're doing for fun, parents are really good bridges for that. So like I have some wonderful conversations about StarCraft which is one of my son's interests and how it relates to issues of history and power and war and so on that happen in history class and because I know enough about the StarCraft world and I've gone through a similar history curriculum we can have really fun conversations so that's just been a really enjoyable part of uh, getting involved in my kids interests um, now I'm gonna put my moderator hat on for a sec and then I think there's some questions about sort of how does connected learning, how is it different from, you know, other forms of youth serving sort of and learner-centered progressive approaches? And I was wondering, on May, if you might want to comment, just because you've had so much involvement in a lot of educational reform efforts and youth serving efforts, and if you could speak to at least some of what you see as maybe unique or also similar from what uh, other reform efforts that you've been part of? I mean, I think one of the really um, great things about uh, connected learning is that it is actually pulling together and providing a framework or a house of sorts for a lot of initiatives that I think have been um, ongoing um, uh, as well. And I think about um, the after school field, is, which um, is where I came from before, and I think Buffy spoke to a lot of it already, but a lot of the, I think, philosophically in terms of the interest-driven um, uh, and uh, peer support and um, having the right mentors are a, a very, very important part of what uh, makes, you know, good after-school programs work. I think one of the things that after-school programs have uh, really been challenged by is is how to connect to the rest of what's happening in um, a, a, a youth's life during the day. So whether it be in school or out of school or in family time, and I think connected learning um, has such potential to really um, um, pull those pieces together in a way that um, not just the youth, but the parents and uh, the educators both in and out of school um, are connected um, by what um, the youth are learning and actually have a role in it and in some way and understand um, the types of, of, of things that um, the youth are experiencing um, and, and can see the enjoyment that's happening. And, and Buffy, who's worked in after school programs, I'm sure can really, you know, speak to that on a very, very um, practical level. But um, this has such great implications for um, fields like after school or libraries and museums where they have been, um, uh, uh, you know, they've been isolated. Um, from, um, I think, the traditional learning experiences that are occurring. Buffy, you've been nodding, and I see you have some comments in the chat um, about issues of discovery and trying to connect some of the experiences. I don't know if you want yeah, sure. to speak some of what Anme was saying. Sure. Well, you know, it's been um, an interesting experience um, you know, being in a school library, which although, you know, that functions within the bigger learning ecosystem of, of the public school, in some ways, um, even though you're trying to support the curriculum and be integrated with that, you know, you're also still trying to have this organic space that is, you know, learner or student driven, um, but not feel as though you're isolated, you know, from the elective and core academic areas. Um, and, and certainly now that I'm in a public library environment, I really am curious to see, you know, what what could this look like? Um, you know, if, if a public library is really adopting these principles of connected learning, you know, how do we move from being, you know, as, as May said, you know, kind of, you know, that, you know, supportive, uh, entity on the side to uh, again more of a, a really pivotal community of learning that is integrated 
you know, with these other kinds of experiences and learning spaces of young people, as well as, as you, as May mentioned, the parents, you know, can we also find ways to promote intergenerational learning, um, you know, in these alternative of sites or, or spaces of learning, whether they be physical spaces, you know, virtual experience or some kind of blend of the two. Um, I, I agree. I think there's tremendous potential and that's something that I think, um, you know, a lot of us that are in libraries and museums and, and other community uh, spaces of learning, you're know, interested in not being isolated or, oh, that's, you know, nice and fun on the side, but um, really thinking about how do we support, you know, other groups in our bigger learning community um, to do something that's empowering and, and elevating for both, you know, the individuals as well as the collective community. Yeah, I really appreciate your bringing up the point, Buffy, about the broader communities that we want to enlist into this because, you know, I think I spoke uh, from the point of view of a parent who's already fully resourced and brought into this model, but the reality is that it's so critical that our public institutions and schools um, are also part of um, providing these on-wraps and opportunities because uh, what we're finding is that it's really sort of the privileged and digital savvy families that are kind of taking up these opportunities and that these opportunities are being privatized. So while it's fantastic that there are families who are really into maker culture or digital opportunities, uh, what we know empirically is that it really tracks around traditional lines of privilege and this needs to be part of the public educational agenda and that's really, really critical to the message that we're trying to get out with this report is that it's not just about um, a technique for already privileged families to do what they do even better <laughs> um, to gain more advantage, but it's really an agenda for social and collective movement uh, um, that we hope to be part of that is about also transforming some of the public agenda around this. Um, I see we're getting some questions in the live stream that's sort of getting back to this question of how do you start enlisting uh, folks through the school environment into some of these perspectives. And Katie, I don't know if you want to speak to it. It looks like the questions are sort of about what are some of the concrete strategies for trying to get parents and teachers on board and supported. Um, I know that's uh, you have such an innovative model for your schools that you've sort of been in the trenches of trying to figure out how to uh, bring diverse constituencies into this work. I can talk about that, um, yeah, a little bit. So, <clears throat> one of the um, one of the biggest challenges, I think, uh, is a sense of um, how do you know what connected learning looks like, um, and what it should look like, and maybe when it's not happening. So, what so some of the challenges with parents is that they're used to cl classrooms looking a certain way. Um, so kids are in their seats, they're listening to the teacher, there are books on the table, um, kids are working quietly on their own, and that, there's a kind of trope around that that's what school learning might look like. Um, and when you begin to bring connected learning into a classroom where you have an emphasis around peer-based learning, uh, when you have an emphasis around inquiry-based and production-based learning where kids are building things or doing those things together, where the teacher is not necessarily leading by direct instruction all of the time, um, where kids are often collaborating, that just looks really, really different than what a lot of parents think school should look like. And so, um, you know, part of the education process at our schools is then um, inviting parents to come in and actually see classrooms in, ac in action and be able to talk through with them sort of why the structure of the classroom is the, is the way that it is and then give them opportunities to actually talk to the young people about what they're learning because the kids are incredibly articulate um, or can be about what's sort of happening, the types of uh, learning that they're doing, what, what this sort of means to them. Um, and so making the, you know, one of the core principles of connected learning is around um, openly networked and sort of transparency. And so I think this notion of building environments that allow people to see in, we talk about it at the Institute of Play as allowing a view in to the work is really critical um, to have that dialogue with people um, to sort of see what it looks like on the ground. But it is a, um, um, a change in paradigm in terms of expectations about what people 
imagine that they that they might be able to see. The same thing with teacher practice. So we do a lot of professional development at our schools, um, supporting teachers and beginning to try to uh, run classrooms in a way that may look different than the way that they've been trained. Um, to begin to move to a model again where they um, are, uh, let's say, running a lot of collaborative work. Like that isn't isn't actually an easy thing to do with 34 kids in the classroom. It's not easy. It's, it requires a whole set of skills. So part of this work is, is um, really beginning to understand what are the skill sets that come with the principles, and then begin to understand, well, what are the kind of supports that we need to put in place broadly as a field um, to help the adults you know, develop those skills. And so professional development, um, in our case, is a huge part of the model. And we include parents, you know, parents in that professional development piece. I think we're we're getting more questions around this, Katie. That I I I really like this model of you know giving visibility to the model in action. I think there's some questions on the live stream about just you know how do you assess in a context like that where the learning is messy and non-standardized? How do you how do you get around the demands of a more formal assessment accountability? Yeah, so one thing I'll say, and we actually don't, I, I don't think spend too much time talking about this in the current report that just came out, partially because we as a group haven't done that much work around it, but will going forward, is that I think that connected learning really stresses formative assessment rather than summative assessment. So when we talk about formative assessment, it's assessment for learning rather than assessment about learning. Um, and so beginning to change, and, and a lot of the, because of No Child but Less Behind and the kind of regime of testing, it's really been an emphasis, um, at least narratively, and often in practice around summative assessment, like that, that the points you assess a kid at are after they've gone through an experience and then you're gonna kind of test them on that. Um, so what we try to think about in developing curriculum, both for the informal and the, the um, formal learning spaces, is you start with this question of what are the outcomes that you hope to see and in the case of connected learning, they're both traditional outcomes, the common core, the state standards, but they're also a whole set of learning outcomes around things like collaboration, around things like empathy and perspective taking, around things like uh, model-based reasoning and complex problem solving. So a whole set of these 21st century skills, which have been named in a lot of different ways by a lot of different, different groups and, and people, um, you begin to uh, start, you start with a subset of those and then you design an experience that you believe is going to give kids an opportunity to do practice around those things and then actually provide evidence of what um, some kind of learning or proficiency in, in let's all just pick collaboration might look like. And you have to know from the, get, the beginning what you think evidence of good collaboration might look like. And then you begin to design experiences, again, that give rise to opportunities for kids to sort of produce that evidence. Now, it's very hard to capture on a quiz evidence of collaboration, right? You could do a kind of rubric where kids are self-reporting on things, but you may need to begin to look at other kinds of assessment environments, which may be online digital environments that require kids to collaborate and then actually track things like the number of times they ask for help, might track things like the roles that they might take on in the kind of team. Um, and this is where the you know, new media comes in as, a, I think, quite a strong lever within connected learning because computational environments allow us to track and record um, choices that kids might make and, and kinds of practices that they might have within an online environment. That's actually very hard for an individual teacher, again, in a classroom of 35 kids to pay attention to. And so when we begin to talk about assessment and evaluation relative to connected learning, we do want to begin to think about what new media gets us um, in the case of formative assessment tools and formative assessment environments. Um, and so I think that is a whole body of work um, that the connected learning field can really con contribute to and lots of folks that are on the live stream um, may be already doing work around. And so I think that's one of the more exciting, I think, spaces for the, the um, work to go is to really grapple with that question of how do, how do you really assess it um, and, what, and what does it, what does again, what does it really look like in practice? And just to build a little bit on that, um, you know, I think that the challenges of dealing with assessment in school are really real technical um, thorny challenges that are sort of critical, the critical kernel to getting this whole issue of outcomes and what does success look like nailed down. I also think it's important to zoom out from the school context and sort of ask questions about what does it take for kids to thrive in life and not just in school. 
And I think that's where it's really, really challenging because you're trying to get those different accountabilities and assessments or visions of success working together in this cross-sector model. Um, but one of the things that, you know, in this question of what does it look like when it succeeds and was part of informing this model is, you know, all the ethnographic work we did with young people and their own narration of what was were really formative experiences for them, to take Katie's language. And the model really grew from the sense that people who were really successful learners in life, who were problem solvers, who could get things done, who could work collaboratively with others, who knew how to find knowledge when they needed it, um, they often narrated these experiences when they were really into something, which they might have been into because of their friends, because it was part of school, or because they had a deep passion. Um, but they were able to do that exploration and inquiry and actually make a productive contribution to a social collective in a supportive way where they had friends and mentors um, but they were also going deep into knowledge and expertise based activity and it was that constellation of those three spheres that we describe in the model that really you know when you describe those components to people and you elicit um, what made them feel successful as learners, uh, what is their best learning experience. You know, it, it was a very vivid picture that people can often paint, and school often had an incredibly important role to play within that, but their peers, their families, uh, their interest groups, their popular culture also often had an important role to play, and that's why with the model we try to be very ecumenical and agnostic about the entry points and the areas of interest and the institutions, but we're pretty clear about what we think the learning should look like. Um, and I think that's what makes the connected learning model a little bit more distinct because it's not tied to a particular method or institution or content domain, but it's about that experience of learning that people describe as often very informative. Now, we're kind of um, inching up at the end of our hour together. I'm trying to monitor the live stream, but there's a really rich conversation there which I can't keep up with, which is great. Um, and so as is usual with our practice on the Hangouts, I wanted to give the opportunity of everybody on the Hangout to uh, pose a last comment uh, um, or reflection to the group. Uh, and then I'll, I'll let Katie have the last word uh, since I just had my last word. Uh, so, I don't know who wants, Leanne, do you want to jump in for a closing statement? Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, yeah, this is really fascinating. I have to admit, I was, haven't been really that well read in the connected learning stuff, so I'm really excited to read through the report. Um, I think some of the stuff that Buffy was saying about the socioeconomic barriers kind of in some of the side chat is really interesting too, because I've also been doing some other smaller projects with um, at-risk youth in urban Cincinnati. And there's definitely, I mean, one of the things that we've identified with talking to the neighborhood people and the parents is that idea of that third parent in the neighborhood or even, you know, a lot of them have single parent homes, but then they also identify that having a larger network in their neighborhoods, which is a really interesting thing that's come from um, a series of workshops that we've done with the adults. So we've then been trying to um, build some workshops around those, what we've heard from adults back in with the kids. So. I'm interested to see if there's a little bit more about that in the report. So that was kind of something I took away from all this, but very interesting all together. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Leanne. Buffy? Well, I too have really enjoyed today's conversation. It's been very thought provoking and um, I think it's just going to, you know, continue you know, my journey as I, I dwell in thinking about, you know, what do these different kinds of learning spaces look like and, and how does a connected model of learning, um, you know, give us, you know, whether we're school, a library, you know, whatever the, the institution or space may be, you know, how does this give us the opportunity to, you know, help um, learners who are marginalized in their families and to, you know, engage in a, a critical sort of pedagogy in which we can provide learning experiences um, that, as you said, you know, help people thrive, but, but also to give them a sense of agency, you know, and, and what are these participatory mediums, whether they're 
you know, technology based or, you know, face to face kinds of experiences or a combination of the two, you know, how can we use that connected model of learning um, to engage you know, in, a, in a critical discourse and, and to engage in an inquiry stance, you know, and how we think about learning and, and connecting different kinds of, of learning spaces, you know, across uh, a, a particular community. Thanks, Buffy. On May, do you want to jump in? No, no, only to say that I, I just think this just has such implications for helping people sort of re reflect on where they've been. I mean, I think oftentimes people who um, especially are working in the field or, or, or need to focus on, um, you know, providing activities to meet certain needs, but don't necessarily have a frame to think about it in and to be able to reflect on that and to be able to actually think strategically about, um, you know, all the different ways that um, uh, youth can learn and then all the different resources they have in the community and how those can um, um, interact with one another and collaborate. It, it, I think this is going to be um, a, a, a terrific um, opportunity to do that for folks. So thank you very much for all the work you guys have done on this. It's been really great to watch the journey. Thanks so much, Anne. Katie, you want to have the last word here? <laughs> sure. So I guess what um, what I want to end with is that it, it just feels to me like the connected learning model is really a um, a way to invite everyone in to the project of learning of young people. Um, and the anecdote I'll give is so I work in the, the area of games and have done a lot of work with the games industry and there's been a kind of sea change within that industry partially because the designers are coming of age, they're having children, and suddenly there's, there's a lot of reflection on their own part about what can their contribution be to the learning of their own child, um, but also more broadly to the learning of young people. And so the games industry, for example, is now fully on board with really trying to understand how can they help, how can they contribute, what can they do to become part of beginning to change the way that we, that we think about learning. And so what I love about the model is that I think it's incredibly inclusive um, and it's inclusive in its sort of distributed kind of crowdsourced nature, which says that actually the, the project of learning is a responsibility of many, many, many different types of people and many different types of institutions. It's moving beyond a sort of siloed model that school is the place that owns the learning of a young person. And in fact, we know that if we want children to be able to thrive and be lifelong learners, that they have to see learning as possible 24-7 and in sort of any space that they're engaged in. Um, and so that's what's really exciting to me and what I hope this report feels like is an invitation um, and in some way a kind of implication for people to get involved um, and that there is a role for them to play within, um, within the kind of future of thinking about learning broadly. Um, and that to me is super exciting, scary, because uh, it's complex, but I think that there is a, a real place for all kinds of organizations, um, all types of practices, all types of people um, in beginning to contribute in some way. So that's, that's pretty cool, I think. Thanks, Katie. And that's a fantastic segue to uh, my closing comments as a moderator, uh, which is to say this webinar is the first of a mini-series that we'll be having around the release of the Connected Learning Report, where we'll, you'll be hearing from many more of the uh, uh, report's authors who represent uh, really diverse, uh, unique, and specialized uh, kinds of uh, perspectives into the Connected Learning Model. So you'll get a sense of the kind of diversity that uh, Katie is talking about, but I also wanted to, so I want to really encourage people to continue to connect and dig in um, if, uh, if you can and uh, experience not only the sort of entry points that may be close to home for you, but also this range of perspectives and uh, research that's represented in the model. Uh, there, this uh, webinar, as all of ours are, will be archived on the ConnectedLearning.tv site and there's an opportunity to continue the discussion there. Uh, we're also experimenting with a new uh, community, uh, the community function in G+. We started a Connected Learning community uh, that just, uh, we just opened that up this week and uh, what 
we're doing there is, uh, is really just inviting uh, participation and conversation and keeping track of our events, but I wanted to start hashing out uh, a set of frequently asked questions around connected learning, many of which I saw crop up in the live stream today, but also a bunch of new ones uh, that uh, we can engage with as a community in trying to understand, uh, answer, grapple with. Uh, so I really encourage you to join the conversation in our new community if, if you do have uh, additional questions or answers to how uh, we might improve, uh, implement, uh, research the connected learning model. Um, so a big thank you to all of our participants today, uh, especially your uh, willingness to roll with some of the um, changing uh, membership in the Hangout. Um, and the technical problems, which is just part of our learning uh, when we're doing all this <laughs> online stuff. So I uh, look forward to engaging with you all, and uh, thanks for a great conversation. All right. Thanks, everyone.